Golang Sea Island. Uh, if you search for Golang Sea Island, you will find, um, so the URL is Golang Sea Island.run. Uh, and you can install it, you know, there are installation guide, how to install it and then how you use it. Um, and the default linters, so I will show you, um, I will go to the code base, which is actually used for the, for, for the submission system, which we use. <clears throat> okay, no questions so far. Uh, and I have installed it and if you run it uh, without any, um, so you basically go to your project, to your main Go folder. So in our case, it's um, web service. Uh, and then you run Go lint run. And it will run uh, a number of linters and the linters which are by default are sort of, um, let me see, quick start, no, and linters. So the linters uh, kind of active by default is a check for that code, uh, check if you're checking for errors, uh, some simple uh, style checker, the vet, uh, which used to be in, in, uh, in Go, um, if the assignments are not used, um, if the, um, if some of the code is not being used, so this is kind of a static check analysis for your for your code. Um, there is a check if you have structs with fields that are not used. Um, to, yeah, type check. I don't know really what that one does. Uh, unused constants and variables and so on. And then if you are using um, if you have global variables and constants which are not used. So those are kind of a stat standard ones, which are by default available. And then if I run this on, on our um, code base for the review system, it is clean, right? So it kind of gives no errors and no warnings. And there are some which are useful, but are not uh, de by default enabled. So there is a large list of, um, of checks and I will post on the wiki which ones you will be asked to run against and check how your code behaves, right? Um, so obviously it's good if you, um, uh, for example, for your cloud assignments, you kind of use this tool and check your own code and kind of improve yourself. Uh, and this code gives kind of an excellent, um, excellent comments. So one, for example, is, um, if you have repeated strings that could be substituted by constants, right? So this is sort of like a magic string. Uh, you can think about like uh, magic strings uh, in your code. So if I say, okay, run this one, uh, go static. So it's like I am enabling additional uh, check uh, and running um, uh, go const, go const, const. And then we will see that it's actually the code base is not clean. Uh, that there are some uh, magic strings, like we have a string checkbox, uh, which, which we are using, uh, you know, four times, and then we're doing this type of comparisons. So, well, you know, we should have a constant, uh, which is checkbox, and comparing this, sorry, comparing this to a constant, right? Uh, and so forth. So it's not a big deal. Like uh, we have a couple of those. Uh, uh, occurring multiple times. Uh, some of them are in tests. So then the question is, should you really be, you know, improving code quality in tests? Well, it sort of depends. Um, and here it's kind of four times and four times. So maybe yes, maybe we should uh, have um, constants for that. Uh, but definitely in the main code, we should have that, right? So this one is kind of just an example of a useful one. Another one is uh, magic numbers, which is basically the same, but instead of string, it will kind of check for magic numbers. And this one, numbers, and that one actually is much worse. 
So this one was like one, two, three, or four. Um, yeah, it's called something, or I misspelled it. Uh, let me find it. Magic numbers, it's magic first. Magic numbers, yeah, that way. So with magic numbers, we are much worse. Um, so we have quite a, a large number of different magic numbers used in all over the place, right? Um, so this is, that looks bad, right? Um, sometimes, like you know, if we if you're using it like in the timeouts like this, uh, that's not too bad. Uh, it would be nice not to have the the kind of a magic number use some sort of constants, but that is actually kind of not bad. Uh, but some magic numbers like um, how many like yeah, there are some some tests. Anyway, um, what I what I'm trying to get to is that this is very useful tool for improving your your quality overall. Uh, and then if I run, you can run, you can run it, <laughs> uh, enable all. And that will list, it will actually start using all of them, which is kind of really long list of, um, of checks. Um, it's, it's a very long list of different checks. And then if your code passes all of them, well, you can be proud of yourself, right? So if I enable it for all, um, unfortunately, our code base is quite um, uh, quite messed up. So there are um, globals. Yeah, that's a very offending one. Uh, the, the students who originally implemented the, 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 the system, they have used some sort of a global variables on the package level to store, for example, handles to ADB. That, that's definitely a very bad practice, right? So that's another uh, good check to do. Um, there are some white space and some linting checks. Um, there are some which are kind of uh, useful for parallel tests. Um, there are some, for example, like here, where the checker will check if you're using a variable only for the if statement. And then it will recommend that instead of declaring it in kind of a global uh, scope, you will use it only in the if statement, right? So uh, to rewrite this code into this kind of uh, if statement with declaration of the variable, such that this variable is not visible outside of the if statement. And we have a number of those. So this if short is also kind of a good one to have to check. Anyway, the, you know, almost all of them are quite good. Some, some are not necessary, uh, but, Many of them are really good. And what I'm recommending you is that you basically go and run this on your own submissions, but also for your assignments for cloud, where you're learning more about Golang and when you're trying to improve your code quality, this way will kind of um, help you, right? And for the final Inspira assignment, you will have to report what have you missed and what you have learned from this tool uh, for the Golang assignments, right? You will not be you know, marked down for violations, but you will be kind of marked up for learning what you could have improved, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, Martin is asking if the code will be heavily evaluated on the quality versus efficiency. No, it will be evaluated on both. So for a Golang assignment um, two, especially the efficiency, the um, and the uh, accumulation of error on the floating point is as important as the quality. So all three elements are kind of important. Um, I am mentioning this because you are currently working on assignments for cloud and this tool will kind of help you to make and learn more about Golang because it, it gives excellent suggestions of how you can improve your code. How can you make your code um, um, Cleaner, one really nice one. Uh, so in relation to in relation to question from Martin is that there is um, I will find it. Um, let me see. Let me see. Pre alloc. Yeah. So this one, for example, uh, let let me run it on the go 
the alloc, what was it spelled? Three alloc, but without go. So this one, for example, tells you that you are uh, declaring slices without pre-allocation, pre-allocating the space. And that is actually a, um, a performance enhancement, right? So instead of doing this, you can use uh, make with the pre-allocation of space for the particular slices that we are kind of using. As you see, we're not very offending, like only in three places, we have the, the problem with that. Um, but that will improve your performance as well because you will be kind of uh, not doing uh, allocations in code. So it is a mix. So this go like go um, Golang linter is not only for static check analysis of code quality, but it is also for um, some of the hints, some of the suggestions for um, performance as well. <clears throat> Yeah, so Suzanne is asking if there will be a kind of a checklist and I will do this checklist um, on the wiki and I will ping you on Discord when, it, when it's ready. Okay, so th there is none yet uh, because <clears throat> I'm still sort of uh, working out uh, with Christopher uh, what to pay attention to, what is important at this point, because as you've noticed, this list is huge, uh, but you know, you can start already with uh, playing with this. Uh, and then I will put the uh, the details uh, the detailed list on the on the wiki. All right, so that that's about Golang um, and about the submission system. So the to sum it up, use the uh, use this use the um, uh, the Golint. Go, Golang CI Lint tool. Uh, it's, an, it's an excellent tool. Um, and I will post uh, the checklist on, on the wiki. Okay, so now um, there was one more thing. So one more thing is about the pipes and the make FIFO. Um, of, obviously on Mac and on Linux, it works flawlessly. On Windows, it doesn't work. Uh, but that, that is not the main point. Um, if it doesn't work and if you cannot test it, that's okay. Uh, what you can do is you can run uh, two terminals and you can sort of simulate that it works by kind of copy and pasting from one to the other. Uh, the important thing is that if you do want to make it work, um, you will notice that uh, stack prints a lot of garbage out into the standard output. And then it's kind of tricky to align it like what one program gets uh, from the other. So you, you will need to build it and kind of run it manually. You will also notice that when you plug in two programs together uh, by feeding the pipe from one output to the other input and vice versa, you will see nothing on the screen. So what often happens is you run it and then your programs just uh, quit like a stop or you run it and your programs just lock <laughs> and you don't really know what happened, right? Um, so for that purpose, uh, if you really want to test it with the pipes, uh, you will have to use uh, kind of a, a small program, which you will use in the middle to lock things to a file such that on a third terminal, you can kind of uh, see what is happening. Uh, because uh, normally if you kind of uh, combine two pipes together, then you, you know the, the programs will communicate, but you will kind of not see what is happening and the programs will not be able to tell you what is happening because they will be using standard output and input from the, from the pipes such that it's kind of invisible to you. So you either have a logger and inside the program, you can kind of write into a file and then uh, in, you, you kind of duplicate the output. So you put, put something into the standard output, but you also log some things into a file. And then by observing that file, we'll be able to kind of check it. But as I'm saying, the, the main point is not for you to really play with pipes. The main point of view is to learn Haskell. <laughs> and if playing by pipes will make you learn Haskell, that's great. But don't get hang out on it. Um, focus on the logic and focus on the, on the implementation first. And then if you have that going, then you, you can sort of play with pipes. Um, we do have the ability, and you do have uh, that in the cloud course, if you're taking the cloud course, to have access to a Linux virtual machines 
in Sky High and to run your stuff on Linux instead of your Windows box. And um, if you do need a Linux box, uh, you can just let me know and I will uh, set it up for you. Or you can reuse the ones that you've already have uh, from cloud course or some other courses or some other resources in, in Sky High. Uh, so there is no problem. Uh, and in fact, I kind of encourage you to, to play with Linux and to build these things on, on Linux. Um, and we, um, like we are sort of a platform independent. So it, as I'm saying, like if you do need a Linux box for your, uh, for your tests and for uh, building things, um, let me know, make, make an issue in the issue tracker and then uh, I, will, I will set you up S same way as we have it in the cloud course. All right, so that's, that's this, that's the pipes, uh, that's the submission. Any, any questions related to those topics? No, all right, so we can close this one. Go lint CI lint, go lang CI lint, remember that one. Um, this one we discussed, so okay, so now let's move on and talk a little bit about Haskell. So please fire up uh, Menti to this code. And I will, oh, yo, 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 this one crashed. Yeah, that, that one crashed. So let me close this one. Let me move on. So yes, you can ask questions here as usual. It's a little bit annoying because I'll have to switch the screen. Okay, so um, maybe I can just do this, yes. So the first topic that we are discussing is uh, binary versus unary operations. <clears throat> it's pretty simple. Um, you know, binary operations take two arguments, unary operations take one argument. So no, <laughs> No big uh, difficulty here so far, right? Uh, most of the things that we will discuss today are um, kind of deep because you can really spend a lot of time on them. You can go really deep into the category theory and into the math, uh, but that's not the point. Uh, the point for us is to kind of get the bare minimum of being able to use the vocabulary to discuss certain concepts. Uh, and that's, that's all we need. Uh, we don't need to fully understand the category theories and we don't need to go into the really the math behind groups and semi-groups. Uh, but the basic things are actually pretty simple uh, and anybody can, can kind of follow. So what we will do is we will sort of um, try to carve out of all this heavy theory, the bare minimum such that we can discuss things. Um, and what we really want to uh, be able to do so let me see, um, is to be able to discuss. Uh, okay, so if I go, if I open uh, the interpreter and I ask what's maybe, uh, and if, if, may, if, if the description tells me maybe is a functor and maybe is a monad, and maybe it's a semi-group, I should be able to understand what it means. Um, those are kind of a fancy words, um, which we normally don't met. And uh, actually you could have met Functor in C++, but uh, most of them you probably haven't met yet. Um, and then they are kind of uh, very useful because they are not only used in Haskell, but you can use them like applicative. You can use in many programming languages. You can use it in JavaScript and many, um, libraries are kind of uh, using those terms when they're describing what is happening. So the purpose of this lecture is to sort of uh, introduce them and to follow the, the kind of a bare minimum, right? So first, binary unary operations, no questions about it, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, a function which takes operation, which takes two arguments or one argument. Okay, so 
um, why it's not moving. Yes, it's moving, but it's moving slow. So let's do some quizzes. So the plus operation, what is it? Well, the new term appears here, ternary, right? So unary, one argument, binary, two arguments, ternary, three arguments, no, no problems. Excellent. So um, half of the people got it right, half <laughs> got it wrong. It's a plus, okay? How many arguments a plus takes? Um, in most programming languages, uh, plus is a binary operator and doesn't have a unary equivalent, right? We don't have uh, a um, plus which takes one argument. Uh, we only have plus which takes two arguments. So the binary is the correct answer here. We do have minus, for example, in Haskell, which is both unary and binary, right? Because you can have a minus five, and it means negation of five, which is minus five, or it has minus five, which is uh, um, yeah, like normal minus, same as plus, takes two arguments, right? Okay, let's move on. So next question. Mm, more fancy, plus plus. What is it? That's kind of a Haskell specific. Uh, although other programming languages, of course, have an equivalent um, to, um, to the concatenation of, of lists, right? So what is plus plus? It's a binary operator which takes two lists and produces a list, right? Um, so it has left hand side and right hand side, and both sides are lists, and then the result is a list. And it's a binary. All right, we have a little, a little bit better score this time. So let's see. Multiple. Multiple hundred, it's a function. It's a function which is also a, a carry. Um, so what is that function? Is it unary function, binary function, or ternary function? It's a unary function, fantastic, no errors here. And it is a carry, right? Because it is produced by a binary function, which has one of the arguments already fixed, right? So here we remember the term carry and remember the, that is a unary operator. Simple, we're moving, we're getting better. Ooh, comma, comma, that's an interesting one. What is this one? Is it unary, binary, or ternary? How many, how many arguments comma comma takes? Have you used comma comma? Again, it's a little bit Haskell specific, although other programming languages also have uh, ability to produce tuples. Um, and this is a ternary operator because it's an operator. Yeah, let's, let's ask. Uh, Let's ask um, the interpreter to tell us what it is. Well, look, uh, it's a tuple operator, uh, which takes three arguments uh, and produces, so it takes three arguments and produces kind of a tuple with three arguments, right? So what you can do is you can say, tuple tuple and say one, two, three, and it will produce a tuple which has three elements, right? 
Similarly, you can do that with a single comma to obtain a tuple out of two arguments, right? So if you use a single comma and two arguments, you get, you get that. So most people, sorry, most people got it right. It's a ternary. If we use a single comma, that would be a binary, right? There is, of course, you can make a carry out of this. So you could say, I want to have, uh, no, I can do this. Um, that doesn't want to work with the, no, that's, I don't know the syntax, to be honest, uh, how to make a carry out of the comma such that we could, um, yeah, I, I know how to do it like this. So I could make a carry like that and then apply T to a single argument, right? So now T is a carry of the binary comma. Um, and if I ask what, what T is, it says, well, it's a, it's a function which takes a single argument, but it has to be a number because the other part of the, um, no, the, the number is already in there. So it will produce a tuple with the first argument already being a number because I, I did, I, come on, I did the, uh, the binding here. Um, and then the second argument can be anything. So it could be a string. I can apply it to, to a string. Uh, I can apply it to another number, right? So the second argument is unspecified, but the first one is fixed uh, to be a number. Uh, but I don't know how to do it in line, how to make a carry out of the comma in line. Anyway, that's not really that important. Important is that this is a ternary uh, operator. Cool. So we have some, some people doing very well, some people doing not too bad. Looks good. All right, let's move on. So another very simple topic is an identity element. Uh, identity element usually is called ID. And in Haskell, as you could imagine, there is an ID function, which basically returns what you give it. So if I say, give me an ID of one, it will give me one. If I say, give me an ID of a text, um, it will give me that text, right? It does nothing, right? It's a function which returns what you give it. So it returns what you pass to it, right? So identity is, um, identity is an element which when given to a given operation, doesn't change the, the um, uh, original argument, right? So, an identity element with the binary operation doesn't change the first argument, it just returns the first argument. Um, so it's an operation which um, is invariant, right? So it sort of uh, doesn't change um, what, what's there. So here uh, I'm asking you to give me examples of operation followed by a space character, followed by an identity element. Uh, what you know already that um, work in that fashion. So if I have a particular operation and I'm looking for an identity element in that operation, what that would be? So, Is it understandable what, what, what I'm asking you to do? No clue. All right, so let, let me see. If I take the plus and I take a zero, that would be the answer to that call, right? Because if I write anything plus zero and plus is the operation and zero is the identity element, then I will always get whatever is the first operation, uh, first argument, right? So this is plus zero is an example of what you should type here as an operation and the identity element. 
like plus space zero. What other operation and identity elements do you know already? Const. Um, Okay, so I will talk about cons later. Multiply one, perfect, right? Multiply one is perfect example because no matter what I put here, and then if I say multiply it by one, I will always, I will always get what the first thing was, right? So that's that's what we want. Uh, what else? Divide one, perfect. Uh, so division by one gives you the first element as well. Um, minus zero, perfect. Some questions, yeah, multiple by one, excellent. That's good too. We have it, what else? At zero, yes, plus one, plus, I mean plus zero, yes. Divide by one, multiply by one. All right, so um, with const. So let's remind ourselves what const does. Um, so const takes two elements and always returns the first one, right? So it doesn't matter what you pass as the as the second argument. Um, so if I say anything like you know anything here, const and anything here, then I will always get the first thing, right? So it means for the const operator, the identity element is actually anything, right? It's, it, you don't have, it doesn't have to be zero. It can be anything because const always returns the first element anyway, right? So it, it is kind of a funny function. Uh, you may say, yeah, that's like a ridiculous function. Why would I ever need to use const, right? Well, you may need to use it because for example, if you call a particular function and the function returns you, um, you know, two things, and then you need to get the first one. You can use const for that, right? Um, yes, uh, wrong, wrong screen. What else? What else do you think you already know in Haskell that follows the same, the same pattern? The power, yeah, power of one. That, that's our arithmetic, modulo one, arithmetic. Okay. Try to find something which is non-arithmetic which also follows that. Any ideas? Um, ID, ID not really because ID is a kind of a unary uh, operation. Um, all right, so I'll give you a hint. So we already talked about the binary operator, which is this one. Does this operation has an identity element? So we're talking about plus plus. So we're talking about if I have something here, plus plus something else, and I want to get some, what something else would need to be? What would be that to be an identity element for plus plus? Come on, it's simple. All right, make it simpler. So I have a list. I have a list of two elements and I want to concatenate it with something. And I want this to give me the list of those two elements. What I need to concatenate it with, what I need to put here for this to work. Um, 
So Martin is suggesting something, yes. Uh, and ah, uh, you cannot enter more than one suggestion. Okay, sorry for that. All right. So Martin has suggested uh, plus plus. Uh, sorry, an empty string. So Martin suggested an empty string, right? And that works, but that only works for strings. So if I have hello world and I concatenate it with an empty string, then indeed an empty string is an identity element for um, concatenation of strings, right? But in concatenations of lists, uh, you have to generalize it. And the identity element is basically an empty list, right? So if I say, and remember that strings are basically lists of characters, right? So I can kind of do that here, but I can also do that uh, with this one, one two list, right? So an empty list and empty string is an empty list, but it has kind of a syntactic sugar because it is an empty list of type car, right? Of elements of type car. Yes, perfect. So um, Nora, Nora has a, a good answer, which is an, an empty, exactly an empty list. Excellent. So let's continue. Um, a next term, associative binary operation. Okay. So we know an identity element. We know binary, ternary, and unary operators. Uh, now we're learning about associative binary operations. Uh, so again, it's very simple. Um, the associative binary operation is such an operation that if you have them chained um, in kind of an, in sequence, it doesn't matter where you put the brackets, right? So whether I put brackets here and I do this first, or whether I put brackets here and I do this first and then this one, it doesn't matter, right? So associative binary operation kind of boils down to functions that um, doesn't matter in which order you do the, the brackets, right? And as you know, a function application in Haskell uh, is basically um, kind of done by space. And a function application in Haskell is associative binary operator because it's sort of, uh, doesn't matter if I do this first and then this together, or if I do this first and then this together, right? So the application of functions is um, one of the examples. So the next question, of course, is give me examples of associative binary operations that you already know. Um, it should be pretty simple. Um, with the examples that we've used for um, yeah so plus is a good example minus is a good example what else multiplication is a good example perfect concatenation is a good example indeed yes it is Division, multiplication, perfect. You, you got the gist, right? So that's that simple. So remember that the only fancy term is that it's associated, right? We just need to remember it's, uh, we know what how it works, we know what it is. We probably just didn't really use in our normal life this kind of term, associated. Not big deal, okay? Learning one term. All right, next one. So monoid, whoa, a scary word. <laughs> so what is a monoid? Uh, so as, as we were seeing here, if I ask what is, for example, um, maybe it says, yeah, actually it says it's a monad. Um, um, let me see. Sorry, I'm uh, having trouble with my keyboard. Oh, yo, 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 yo. 
where is it? Crap. No, this one, yes. Not this one. All right, so, no, that's not the monoid neither. Yeah, anyway, monoid. Uh, we will not be using the monoid a lot. We will be probably using monad more, uh, but a monoid is effectively um, a structure that is composed of associative binary operation and I, an identity, man, uh, identity element, right? So, um, ah, yeah, because monoid is actually called semigroup in, um, it, it, yeah, so th this is a monoid here. Yeah, you see, monoid. Sorry, sorry, my mistake. Um, so, in kind of a fancy terms, it is basically operations which behave like the ones which we have here with the identity element, right? So, if you do have a binary operator, a uh, binary associative operation, which has also an identity element, then we have something which is called monoid. Uh, and it has certain properties. And those properties are kind of useful for building more complex things. So in, a, in, a, in, in, you know, in the case of multiplication, if I have uh, kind of a sequence like this, uh, I know the whole sequence is within this kind of a monoid structure, and I know there is an identity element, then I can do certain transformations which will not change the semantics of this expression, right? So no matter where I put the brackets, no matter in which order I will do it, and if I do have the identity element, I can kind of a com you know compact it, then I have certain useful properties that I can kind of um, use in my programming to deal with kind of monoids, right? So what is monoid? Well, it is an algebraic structure that has is based on an associative binary operation and an identity element, right? So it kind of sounds fancy, but you already know what it is because you've been using it your whole life. You just didn't know that it has this kind of mathematical kind of um, name, right? And it is, a semigroup in a kind of a category theory, monoids are semigroups with identity because you can have semigroups which have basically, uh, which is an algebraic structure that is based on associative binary operation without an identity, but monoid is a kind of a special case for in which case we do have this identity. And it is important because this identity is sort of a, uh, invariant. It's kind of a fixed point in, in this uh, semigroup, right? Okay, um, simple concept, fancy name, right? So associative binary operation, identity, and that's that's a monoid. Okay, so we let's do one more before the break. Um, commutative binary operation. So this one again is a fancy name for a simple fact that. If you have an operation where you can swap left and right sides, you have a commutative, uh, commutative um, operator, right? So if I have kind of a, a function uh, composition like this, and I have to do this after this, or I do this after this, then it's kind of commutative. So commutative. So that 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 is. Um, the function application in Haskell is an example of a commutative um, binary operation. And then the question to you is what other uh, commutative uh, operations you know? And of course you will list a lot of them, uh, but I want you to list the ones which are associative, but not commutative, right? So, We've listed a number of associative uh, operations before. Uh, so now filter that out and only list the ones which are associative, but they are not commutative. So for example, multiplication is both associative and commutative, right? Plus is again, both 
So which ones are only associative? Nice, so concatenation, exactly. So for example, this one is uh, associative, but it's not commutative, right? Uh, because if we swap the two sides, then we will get something else. Uh, division also is not. So um, uh, minus is also not, exactly. So you see uh, those two concepts kind of uh, play, um, play together. Uh, and some operations are both, but some are only associative, but they are not commutative, right? Um, all right, so we, we kind of learned so far four terms. Uh, we've learned identity, identity element, uh, associative, and of course, binary, ternary, and unary operators. Uh, associative binary and commutative binary uh, and identity. And then based on, on the associative and identity element, we know what semi-group is and what monoid is. So let's have a break uh, and we will continue this uh, into a slightly more complex, but also slightly more useful uh, concepts. We have two more concepts left and then we will have some tools to, uh, to work with a little bit more abstract concepts in Haskell. So let's have, let's have 12 minutes break. All right, time's up. We need to continue. So let me close that. Let's go back here. All right, so what awaits us next? Oh, another question. What is this one? So you, okay, that one is easy then. Select associative binary operations. So which ones of those are associative binary? Uh, that one is easy. I should have 100%. All right, so addition is associative binary. Multiplication, negation, yeah, this one is um, single. It's a unary operation, right? So it's a unary minus and unary not. Um, subtraction and division are not associative. Okay. So now remember what monoid was, it needs to be associative and it needs to have the, yeah, that one is a very short time. Uh, it has to have the uh, identity element. So, okay, set of integers with plus. So plus is associative and it has an identity, which is zero, uh, that works. Uh, strings with concatenation. Yes, that's uh, concatenation is associative and strings, empty string is an identity that works. Multiplication that works with the uh, one and uh, Boolean values with the end operator, right? So that's another, um, that's another semi-group uh, because we have an operation, so um, yeah, let's see. We see um, the Boolean end is a binary operator, which takes two um, two bools and produces a bool. Um, so if I have uh, anything, and what has to be here? such that I get anything back. So what's the identity element for the, 
for the end operator. <clears throat> Any suggestions in uh, in chat in Zoom Zoom chat? So if I say something and what will give me something? Well, oh, come on, that it's easy. Frederick got it right. Yes, it is true. So if I, we can brute force check it, right? If I say false and true, that's false. Okay, first element, first element. If I say true and true, that's true. First element, first element, whoops, right? So that means true is an identity element for the semi-group, which is a logical end operator. Thus the logical or operator has, a, um, how you do or in Haskell? Yeah, so that's or, thus or has um, an identity operator. And again, Frederick got it right. So the identity um, identity element for a semigroup with the or operator is false, right? Because anything or false will give me back anything, right? So that those are kind of the um, in, in, you know important uh, things to remember that you can have semigroups not only on arithmetic sets, but you can have them on. Um, yeah, like Boolean, for example. And true is for and, and false is for uh, or. Good. So let's move on. Another question? Yes, another question. Well, lots of questions today. Uh, the time was a bit short. Um, so what's the identity element on the set of integers with addition? Well, okay, this one has a long time and that one is trivial. So what is the identity element in the set of integers with an operation binary associative operation addition? Yeah, that we already covered, that should be easy. Right, so the correct answer is zero. So the identity element is zero. Um, so identity element is zero and I have a couple of suggestions. So everyone who said zero, that's a correct answer and the computer graded you correctly, right? Um, it didn't ask about the operation and the identity this time. It only asked about the identity element. So that is almost correct, but you should say zero, right? Uh, and then if you don't know, then of course you don't know. So uh, I'm, I'm saying that because in, uh, in Inspera, at the end of the semester, we will have an electronic exam and some of the questions will be like that. And if you type it wrong, then the chances are you're not gonna get points for it, right? So you need to kind of uh, type correctly. Um, we do check it manually afterwards, but you know, to, to be safe, just try to be answering the correct, the way that it will be kind of auto graded correctly. All right, so next one. Another question, whoa, I prepared a lot of questions. So what's this one? Okay, identity element with the multiplication. Identity element for the set of integers. That one is trivial. So now we should only have correct answers, right? I hope so. Uh, 
Everyone has voted uh, one and everyone, yes, 100% correct, excellent. Great, That's, that sounds good. So next one. Okay, six questions to go. I don't think we will have all the questions now, but. All right, what's the identity element for the set of strings? Yes, we've already covered that as well. So now everyone will answer correctly as well because we've done it already. One more, I guess, come on. Identity element for the semi-group with strings with the concatenation. It's an empty string. So the empty string is the correct answer. Although obviously this one is also an empty string, right? This one is just a syntactic sugar for this. So uh, in those cases, uh, I would say both are correct, um, but this one was safer because it already set strings. So then you can use this one, right? But this one is also correct. Uh, and in Spera, if we do have this question, I would make sure that both are correct. <laughs> um, yes, one more. Okay, we just covered that one as well. So identity element on the set of booleans with the end operator. Uh, what is the identity element? in the set of booleans with the end operator. Yeah, so I guess that should be all correct as well. True is the correct answer, not false, it's an end. So if you actually do anything and false, what you're gonna get? You're gonna get false, right? So that's not an identity element. It's the one which always returns false. It's like a constant. Um, right, so the correct answer is true. All right, next one. No, no more questions for now. All right, we have a little bit of a reshuffling in the leaderboard. Um, but the ones who are doing well are still doing well. Okay, let's continue. So functor, uh, that's another fancy term, okay? So this one is a little bit more abstract, but at the same time, it's also the one that you've used already probably in many programming languages. Um, and you definitely used it in uh, when you, used a map on lists in Haskell. So in category theory, uh, the functor is a mapping between two categories, right? So uh, a functor is basically a map. <laughs> so if you remember that, that's all you need to remember, okay? Um, so let's not go too, too fancy on it. Um, so functor is, a data structure which can be over, which can be mapped over by a function, right? Um, if you've studied C++, uh, you might have encountered uh, the term functor in C++, did you? So anyone who've heard uh, functor in C++? Uh, you can say yes in chat, in the... Uh, Zoom chat. So what is functor in C++? Well, I don't. So if I, um, um, if you have anything defined in C++, and as you know, if, if you have a class, for example, you can overload the, this operator, right? So overloading this operator, um, you know, open and close round brackets, 
because th this operator is like a function call, right? So if I have a name and I do this, then I'm calling a function on which is basically that that name, right? Um, so if I overload this operator on a class, then I can call, I can use this uh, on certain data structures, this operation, the, which is kind of a call function. Uh, so a functor in C++ means I have a data structure that I can call it over uh, as if it was a function. So I can pretend for a particular data structure to be a function. But it's not strictly a function. It is just a data structure that I can call as if it was a function. And that's what it means in C++, which is kind of messed up. Because in mathematics and in Haskell and in other programming languages and in many functional programming languages, the term functor has a, a different meaning. And it means it can be, it is a data structure that you cannot call as a function, but you can map a function over it. Um, and um, this is what we have. Um, th this is uh, what we have already used on on lists. So a list lists are functors, and we can uh, check that. So if I if I uh, do this, yes, I worked out where my keys are on the on the keyboard. I think I just need that. Yeah. So you see, uh, a list is an instance of a functor, right? And what it means is that I can um, I can call an f map on on the functor, right? So what is f map? So if I say what f map is, well, f map is basically kind of um, uh, an ability for me to map a function which takes a and transforms it into b over a functor and produces another functor. And notice that transformation is done inside, right? So I have a functor of, of type A, and then I'm getting a functor of type B, and this function is defining what A and B are, right? So like, for example, if I have, uh, and, and notice that this is a, a unary function, right? So a function which converts A into B, right? So a functor is, a, a data structure which I can use fmap on and supply a unary function which will transform this into that. Um, so now we've spent some time discussing binary functions, but you have to give me kind of a uh, unary functions. <laughs> and because it's very easy to get a unary function out of binary function because we can just carry it, uh, let's use the you know the standard class one. Uh, as an example of a, of a unary function, right? And then what I can do is I can f map it over a functor. Um, and one of the functor that we know is a list. So I, for example, I have a list of three elements and now I can f map this function over that functor and I will get another functor, which means fancy name, I will get another list, right? And now I got the list, which is two, three, four. Um, because lists have um, a kind of a special use case, um, as you see on that slide, uh, fmap for the, for the lists has been called just map. And it, it has been defined as a map to make a list an instance of a functor, right? So to make a list an instance of the functor, we just have to have this mapping function and we say you just use map, right? And, and map is the native way of mapping um, a function over a list. Um, so this is what uh, a functor is. A functor is some sort of a data structure uh, which you can map another function over. And list is like, if you remember that list of functors, then you will kind of remember the concept, right? Uh, usually they are some form of container because what we're doing is we're mapping a function like noticed here, um, we, we're mapping a function A to B over this A on, in this container and getting B in this container and both containers are functors, right? Um, and in the context of a map over lists, the container is a list, 
but you can have other containers and, and we will uh, learn about other containers uh, later, uh, which will kind of also be functors. Um, so that's again, kind of a fancy name, but very simple concept. Uh, and you've used it with lists and you might have used it with uh, some other functors um, in uh, other programming languages. So as I'm suggesting here, you should spend some time play with things. And also for all the things that you are working with, always use the, always use GACI to ask what it is and to kind of learn more about it, right? So you can, for example, ask, uh, is maybe a functor? Well, it is, look, uh, maybe is a functor, right? So if I have a number, so if I have a just 10, um, and then I will, so I have a number which is just 10, right? So our n is just 10. And then I will fmap our hello world unary function over n. Look what happened. I just got just 11, right? So another example of a functor is uh, maybe type. Uh, and maybe is again, a kind of a container because I have some sort of a state and a number. And then I can f map a function over over that over that um, over that functor. So if I say just fifteen, um, I get just sixteen. So what happens if you map plus one over nothing? Okay, nothing is a, a, a an example of a maybe type, and I'm trying to add one to nothing. What will happen? Nothing will happen, literally. Look, nothing, right? So mapping a, a function over a state that actually doesn't contain a number, doesn't throw any error, doesn't do anything. It basically returns nothing. Like it falls back to this kind of uh, state, which is uh, nothingness, right? So I can map anything over nothing and I will always get nothing. Uh, but if I map, a function a of type a over this this kind of a, then I will get something uh, out of this, which will be kind of in, in the container, right? Um, so because the container has to be the same, um, I can do something more fancy. So imagine that I have um, a lambda expression. So I will take x and then um, I will return so, so before we do fmap, let, let's uh, define a function f, uh, which will be a lambda function, which takes x and returns show x, right? So now if I call f5, I'm gonna get five as a string, right? So I'm basically converting something which I'm, I passed to it into a string, right? So now I have my number, my number is just 10. And if I ask for the type of, um, of n, it says it's a, it's a maybe a, but a is a number, right? And now what will happen if I convert it? So I will have an n now, and I will f map my function f over my number n. So now uh, remember, like this, the definition of f is from number to string, right? And here I have a number inside my container and now I will do an N and if I ask what type of an N is, it says, well, it's a maybe string, right? So a type of N was may, maybe number and type of an N is maybe string. So my an N now is just 10 and my N was just 10 as a number, right? So I can change the type because um let's let's recall f map let's recall it right so the function converts type a into type b they don't have to be the same type it's just that when i pass it a functor with type a i'm gonna get the same functor but with type b so it's the same with lists if i have a list of um if i have a list of three numbers and now if i map um, the function f to it, 
I'm gonna also get a list, but a list of strings, right? Uh, because F we define as converting to, to a string. So bottom line, GHCI is your friend, play with it, kind of learn about those uh, type conversions and type mappings because then you will get certain intuitions. All right, let's move on because we have two more or one, uh, two more or one more concept to go with. Actually, we have one really big one, um, which is effects. Um, so what are effects? Well, this is a really complicated topic. Um, in general, um, there are internal effects and there are external effects. Uh, we typically distinguish them uh, by uh, considering what kind of happens outside of the program, outside of the kind of the, uh, the domain or the, the enclosure of where the program is running. Uh, and those effects, which sort of usually happen like on the screen or on a tape or in the network or somewhere which kind of goes out of our control, we call external effects. And then things like maintaining variable state and maintaining kind of a state inside our containers and like inside our just or maybe types, this, you know, those effects are kind of internal to, to what is happening inside the program. But it, it, is, it is kind of a, a little bit more complicated than that. It, it feels simple, but it's not really that simple. And it took um, the computer scientists and the community qu actually quite a long time um, to, um, to work that out and to work out that you can have external effects internalized inside kind of a pure um, data structures inside the, the code. So if I, um, okay, I, I think we have uh, some foundational questions first. So the first question is, does Haskell allow imperative programming? What do you think so far? Uh, not too much time to think about it. So first, just guess. If you don't know, uh, if you know, answer. Uh, and we discuss it a little bit. <laughs> uh, so it was tempting to say yes, I can see uh, for most of you. Um, but the, definitely the correct answer is no. Um, but it kind of, it depends uh, what we define as imperative programming, right? So um, <coughs> if we use the normal notion of imperative programming as if in Golang, for example, then the answer is no. So Haskell doesn't allow you to program the state manipulation the same way as Golang allows you to do. Um, in that sense, it is no. But um, if you think about the state in this more abstract sense, and if you think about imperative programming uh, more narrowly, uh, for example, as sequencing operations, that you do this after you do this, then you do this, then the sequencing operations and kind of expressing um, sort of imperative behavior in your program, yes, it is possible. So this is kind of a, a little bit, you know, th this question will not be in the exam because it, it's a little bit more, uh, you need to elaborate what it means. So depending on how you define imperative programming, the answer could be yes or could be no. Um, so as I'm saying, like if you say, can I program in Haskell same way as I'm, I program in Golang? No, you cannot. Uh, but can I program kind of a sequence of steps that needs to happen? Then the answer is yes. There is syntactic sugar to allow you to do that. And there is a sequencing operator. Um, so for example, if you um, check this one, uh, you can see that it's kind of a sequencing operator which allows you to pass, um, it, it kind of takes, um, two things, it takes this computation and then this computation, and then it sort of gives you the result of the second one. And this one is kind of, um, you know, gone in a sense, right? So it, it, yeah, that, that might be a little bit too hard for now, but 
it allows you to sequence operations. And that's what the do operator does in, um, in some of the monadic contexts that you've been using for IO, for example. Um, so this is kind of a complicated. We're not gonna solve the, or answer this completely today, but I'm just uh, letting you know that uh, we will spend a little bit more time on the concept of state in Haskell. And um, it is a, a little bit tricky to, um, to answer it clearly, but if we define imperative programming in a certain context, then yes, is a correct answer. You can do uh, certain things similarly to imperative programming in Haskell. All right, so next one. Um, three more questions to go. So can you have impure functions in Haskell? Can you program in a kind of an impure way in Haskell? Um, so again, it is how you define purity. Uh, and I have to tell you that it took me a while to appreciate how Haskell actually works and um, to understand that even the functions which seem to use IO and seem to be impure, they are actually pure. Uh, those are pure functions. Um, and the state, the way Haskell deals with the state and the way Haskell deal with this uh, monadic context of IO is uh, very uh, enlightening in, in a sense. Um, so that, you know, th this is less controversial. Um, all functions in Haskell are pure in a sense uh, that they are done in a kind of a functional way. So what is the definition of the, uh, of the pure function? So how would, you, how would you express a pure function? So pure, pure F would be a function that given a certain arguments, um, always uh, return the same state, the same thing, right? So purity, same as in other uh, like, uh, you know, uh, C++, for example, uh, or in, in mathematical sense, it's a mapping between the arguments and the output. And for the given arguments, the output is always the same, right? So the output state is always the same uh, for the given input. Um, so if I have a function, so if I have a function f and the arguments are here, and the computation that the function does result in some output, which is only based on those arguments. Uh, it's not based on anything from outside of those arguments. Then this function is pure. And in Haskell, even the functions which deal with IO in that sense are actually pure, right? Um, so, yeah, you, you, you kind of don't need to fully understand this, but you have to believe me that the answer is no. Uh, and then how it happens that the answer is no, it's a little bit more complex. So this is the kind of the correct answer. Uh, all right, one more. No, two more. Okay, that one is also controversial. So Haskell program is one giant function composed of many other pure functions. So what would you answer if I deleted the, the name pure? Answer as if, you de if, as if I deleted that word. So Haskell, is, Haskell program is one giant function composed of many other functions. Is it true or false? Yes, it's true, right? I mean, if we if we go into, um, yeah, I, I don't want to uh, search the code, but you know, you have main equals, and then you define what main is, and that's one single function. 
And then what main is, is the definition and you kind of compose, you know, this one single function based on the, all the other functions, right? Uh, you may say, yeah, but main has IO, it's in impure because it deals with the kind of external state. And that's what I was kind of trying to explain that, yes, it is, um, it deals with external state, but the behavior of the program is kind of pure in a sense that for the given input and for the given state of the world, it will always produce the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit like you, you may kind of uh, get into the philosophical discussions and as, as you Google it and as you get into reading about it, there are sort of, uh, you know, uh, dogmatic uh, religious wars about this term pure. Um, because some people say, well, in a kind of a strictly uh, mathematical sense, uh, it is true if we take the whole world as part of the kind of the state, but because we cannot really do that, then uh, it is kind of impure, right? <laughs> so it, it's a little bit controversial, uh, but it is a single function. At the end of the day, it is a single function. Um, uh, so why some C, uh, Martin is asking why some C++ functions are not pure? Uh, so uh, that's a good question. So if I say, um, so if I have uh, my, you know, if I have some sort of function um, f which takes arguments, right, uh, and produces this int, um, and if this int is produced by only by calculations on those arguments, and there are no side effects, there there is nothing which is being communicated in and out of that function, then this function is pure. In C++, you can have pure functions as well. The reason why often this function is not pure is because there is kind of a spillover state which goes into the uh, kind of external scope outside of this function. So I can have a variable A. Um, so if I have A equals 10, and here I say A equals 11, then I've already manipulated kind of an outside state. Right, and this function is not pure because it manipulates the state. If I do some calculations and I say b equals a plus one, then I'm taking a state from outside world, not from the arguments. So that function is not pure either. If I, uh, if I, for example, take a struct as an argument and then I say uh, my struct name equals something, I'm manipulating that struct. I'm changing something from outside of the scope of this function and so on. And we often program like this. We often program in C++ in a way that is not conductive for those, um, for the containment of where the state spills over, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean you don't have pure functions in C++, you can. You can have pure functions in C++ and we actually, the, the modern uh, attitude toward programming is to promote um, more and more programming with the use of pure functions, even in imperative programming, because then it's easier to test them, it's easier to maintain them, and it's easier to maintain of what is dependent on what, because the, the functions are sort of self-contained. Uh, um, so that's, uh, that's um, how it is. So let's check if we have some changes in the... Yeah, Lars was not answering, come on, <laughs> and losing some points. Um, all right, so Stian is leading the pack. Congratulations. Crab was fastest. Um, so there is a, a kind of a deeper, um, um, deeper understanding of how Haskell deals with state that we will not deal with today. And the more uh, you go in depth into that, the more kind of um, enlightened you become. And the concept of, of state, the way we deal with state changes your perception of how you should be programming. Um, so there's a question. 
Yeah, so uh, it makes sense that uh, we can program with pure functions in C++. Um, what I'm trying to kind of get you to understand intuitively is that uh, the concept of state in Haskell is done in such a way that the programmer encapsulates a state into a mechanisms that are kind of capturing it in a very enclosed way. Um, and it's different to object-oriented programming that have that, this premise that we will kind of uh, keep the state inside our classes, that you will have a class, and then you will have some attributes, and we will kind of maintain the attributes and close in the, in the, in this, you know, the, the class. Uh, but as you know from object-oriented programming, you end up with kind of manipulating the state all over the place, and you deal with the state kind of in a very ad hoc fashion, right? So I have um, a picture here which says, you know, in, in broad kind of general um, uh, perception of programming, if we go down to kind of like assembly like programming or C++ like programming or Golang like programming or any structured kind of uh, imperative programming, we sort of do instructions and we manipulate the internal state of the program from anywhere in the code. Uh, and then we communicate with the outside world from anywhere in the code as well. So this becomes kind of a very messy proposition. Even if you have classes, even if you have some attempt and then closing the state, uh, you end up with this. Um, and in Haskell, uh, what we do is we try not to get this. We, we try to uh, not to have this complexity of dealing with state at all by kind of composing the state to be handled by concepts like functors and uh, monoids and monads in such a way that it's always kind of contained in that particular data structure and it cannot spill over. So for example, if, you, if you're doing IO in Haskell, um, you cannot do IO from anywhere. You only can do IO from the monadic state, which is in the IO context. Uh, anywhere else in the code, you cannot uh, do anything with IO because you're not in the monadic state. Uh, and vice versa, you can have your own monadic kind of states and closures uh, such that you kind of enclose the state and you cannot go outside of it. Um, one example of that is maybe type um, where you um, kind of enclosing, like we've been enclosing uh, the state of some numerical computation into this enclosure, which either is correct and says just something or fails and, and produces this kind of um, nothingness, right? Uh, that's kind of a mechanism for dealing with uh, things that need to be communicated kind of to, to the outside world. But while you're doing the, um, the computations, you're kind of within this monadic state. So this big question mark is that's where this enlightenment is. And that's what we're trying to achieve uh, using this sort of a more uh, functional enclosures for the things that we're dealing with. So I'm, I'm kind of going over the, the time just a little bit, um, but let's just finish on the functor uh, and we will um, dive into the next uh, element on, on Wednesday. So with the functors, we've, we've, we've learned that we can have this kind of enclosure and we can manipulate the state inside that enclosure without breaking the enclosure, right? Because we maintain the enclosure after the operation is done. And this function is pure. Um, so even, if, even though you may have some side effects, even though you may keep some sort of a state or some manipulation as if in, in imperative programming inside those enclosures, those functions that you kind of do, those functions are pure. Like th this is a, you know, just a transformation from A to B. Um, and then you mapping this within those enclosures. And that's what it, it is all about. It's all about composing your processing, composing your logical uh, relationships between structures in such a way that you don't break certain contracts, that you don't break certain enclosures. Uh, same, as we same as we do with IO in, in Haskell. Um, so this is what the functor is. And the functor is, um, it allows you to uh, apply a function to a, to a value which is inside a particular structure. 
it can be a list. List is a very primitive enclosure, but you, you know, in, in your program logic, you usually deal with more abstract enclosures. Um, and then it works between a normal function, normal pure function, and this kind of a structured value, right? And then you carry certain context, you carry certain things with those values, and then operate on them using the normal pure functions that you would normally do in a kind of a pure uh, functional programming. Um, and then it, it does not work between the structured functions and the structured value, right? So a functor with this F map, it has kind of a limitation, right? So let me, let me go to this for a brief moment. So if I defined my function to be uh, just plus 10, right? And I define my number to be just 10, then I cannot F map F to N. That doesn't work. I cannot apply this a structured function to a structured value, right? So that's what it says here. Functor allows a function to be applied to a structured value. So if I have a function, so f, simple f, which is plus 10, uh, then I can f map simple function to a number and I'm gonna get just 20, but I cannot apply f, right? That doesn't work. So normal function and a structured value. Structured functions and structured value, not yet. Okay, um, so then, yeah, we have two more questions and we finish. So I have some sort of function f, some abstract function f, and I'm applying it to a list of 10 items. So I am applying it to a list and the list is of 10 items. What will happen? Perfect. So it will basically map this A to B. And because it's mapping A to B for all 10 items, I'm going to get 10 Bs, right? So I'm going to get a list of 10 items. Perfect. Um, all right. I think that's it. Yes. So with maybe we're going to start on Wednesday.